We're going to keep this going. Uh, very excited for our next panelist. So I do ask that our panelists go ahead and turn on their uh, webcams and microphones. Uh, we're going to get started now uh, on the reexamination of the 2003 Declaration of Security in the Americas. And to moderate this discussion uh, is a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, we were just on the phone last night, uh, just talking Latin America and the Caribbean and, and you know, uh, in general, and what we can do to support our partners in the region. So Dr. Ryan Berg is a senior fellow in the Americas program and head of the Future of Venezuela Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's also an adjunct professor at Catholic University of America and a research, a visiting research fellow at the University of Oxford's Changing Character of War program. And it's very likely you've seen one of his thousands of publications on any sort of news sites. So I turn it over to you, Dr. Berg. Great, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thanks so much, Randy, for that, that overly charitable introduction. Uh, as Randy said, my name is uh, Ryan Berg. I'm a senior fellow with the Americas Program at CSIS. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for a conversation on the re-examination of the 2003 Declaration on Security in the Americas. Before we jump in, I just want to go over some of the logistics for the event, which will last approximately 75 minutes. Um, following some of the panelists' opening remarks, we'll have a moderated discussion, and then we'll field questions from the audience. I want to remind folks that uh, there's a Zoom Q&A button at the bottom. Throw your comments and questions in there, and we will get to them in due time. Um, as Randy likely reminded folks at the beginning of this session, we do have simultaneous interpretation today in both Spanish and Portuguese. And at the bottom of your screen, you can see the little globe button that says interpretation and select the language that you wish uh, to listen in. Um, we have it in, in Spanish and in Portuguese. Again, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us today for a very important conversation on the reexamination of the 2003 Declaration on Security in the Americas. Nearly 19 years ago, the Special Conference on Security met in Mexico City uh, to discuss a follow-up to the Summit of the Americas meeting in Santiago, Chile in 1998. With this special conference, the attendees strive to expand on topics relating to confidence and security building measures, analyze the meaning, scope, and implication of international security concepts in the hemisphere, and accentuate peace as a value inextricably linked to and a fundamental pillar of democracy, justice, respect for human rights, and respect for international law. Leaders from the hemisphere emphasize the need to develop common approaches to tackling disarmament and arms control, revitalize and strengthen the institutions of the inter-American system, and discuss the future of Western hemisphere security. The conference stressed the unique value that the Western hemisphere process possesses to be able to reaffirm principles, shared values, and discuss common approaches to generate sustainable change and fortify the democratic foundation that the Western Hemisphere is built on. The declaration recognized that the states in the hemisphere face both traditional and non-traditional security threats, in addition to new and other challenges that necessitate a multi-dimensional approach. I think it's safe to say that given the document was negotiated almost two decades ago now, the security threats then barely scratch the surface of the threat landscape now. For instance, cyber doesn't really make an appearance in the document at all. Since the implementation of the declaration, the region has certainly experienced shifts in leadership in regimes as well. Given that democracy was affirmed as a fundamental pillar of security, the region's backsliding and eroding democratic consensus is indeed concerning. Notably, Latin America and the Caribbean is home to the only two countries in the world, Venezuela and Nicaragua, that according to the democracy think tank International Idea, in the last two decades have backslid from functioning representative democracies through all the forms of regime hybridity and eventually to consolidated dictatorship. Lastly, today's discussion precedes the summit of the Americas, the first US, the US has hosted since the inaugural summit in Miami in 1994. And notably insofar as we can discern a summit agenda, Security is not really a strong feature. And so I hope that in some ways the discussion can substitute for that. Today we have a star studded panel to discuss security issues in the hemisphere. Our first panelist is Senator Jose Miguel Insulza, an accomplished Chilean politician, lawyer, and academic 
who has occupied several important positions in his country's government and the inter-American system. Most of you likely know him as the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, which he served from 2005 to 2015. Earlier in his career, Insulsa served as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Secretary General of the Presidency, and Minister of the Interior. He's been serving as a Senator in Chile since 2018. Our second panelist this morning is Dr. Cecilia Farfan Mendez, Head of Security Research Programs at the Center for US-Mexico Studies at the University of California, San Diego. She is also an affiliated researcher with the Center for Studies on Security, Intelligence, and Governance at the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, or ITAM, based in Mexico City. Dr. Farfan is an expert on organized crime and US-Mexico security cooperation and co-founded the Mexico Violence Research Project, an online platform providing analysis and resources for journalists and policymakers on violence and organized crime in Mexico. Our third panelist this morning is Dr. Rebecca Bill Chavez, who recently was appointed president and CEO of the Inter-American Dialogue. And since I haven't yet gotten a chance to congratulate her on her recent appointment publicly, I wanna take advantage of this time to do so. Dr. Chavez served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs from 2013 until 2016, where she prioritized women, peace, and security initiatives, combating the militarization of law enforcement, and expanding defense institution building programs. Earlier in her career as a tenured professor of political science at the United States Naval Academy, her research focused on democracy, rule of law, and human rights including teaching courses on Latin American and Caribbean politics, democratization, and US-Latin America relations. And fourth, uh, our final panelist is Ambassador Anthony Phillips Spencer, a retired Brigadier General and currently Ambassador of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to the United States. He has more than 35 years of experience in the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, where he served in a variety of roles, including as the Vice Chief of Defense Staff. He speaks French and Spanish fluently, and is an avid reader, thinker, and innovator on issues related to organizational development, change and transformation, leadership and management, and strategic security decision-making and public policy implementation. So with that said, I think it's clear that we have an expert panel this morning on tap to discuss this re-examination of the 2013 Declaration on Security in the Americas. I wanna begin with the opening statements of each panelist. And so Senator Insulsa, over to you for your opening remarks. Well, thank you very much, Ryan, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Congratulations for this meeting, and I, I think that uh, coming before the, the the next summit of the Americas, it's very it's a very relevant issue. This is a very relevant issue. Of course, security as the problems of security have always been with us, and the Declaration of Security in the Americas, which was adopted in Mexico at a special conference in security in 2003, is our principal guide. Of security matters, and I do, do believe that it's still very much valid. Actually, uh, the, the, the declaration had its roots on the transcendental shifts in the strategic, political, global, and hemispheric situation that had occurred in the previous decades before 2003. Uh, we had new democracies everywhere. Uh, the wars in Central America had ended. The, 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 the so-called national security dictatorships had already been the giving way to democracy in most of South America. So it was time to review the whole concept based on the Cold War of security in the Americas. And several new issues were introduced. introduced. It's called, the, it's called the, the, the basic concept in the conference is multidimensional security. But that doesn't mean that it covers everything. I mean, I think that a, a, warrant, a, a warning is warranted here. It's not a matter of saying, as the National Security Doctrine said, that everything is security. Rather, security is a job for everyone within democracy. And this, the, 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 the ideas that we set forward in matters of security have, have to start from the concept that we have, that, we, that, that, that they respect human rights and that they can, can be developed only in a democratic society. Now, between 2000 and the, between 1998, when the Summit of the Americas in Santiago, Chile, was decided to have a declaration on on security and 2003, of course, we had unfortunately 9-11. And that uh, made the, the declaration we stressed very strongly the matters of, uh, of terrorism. 
But at the same time, I think it's very important that uh, the, 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 the nations of the hemisphere recognize some new prospects and new problems in matters of security. Probably they have been there before, but never so strongly. And among them, I want to mention, of course, terrorism was you know, certainly in the, the, the state of the declaration. Um, in, in, in the organized international crime, in, uh, transnational crime, the problem of drugs, corruption, the money laundering, illicit traffic of arms, and all the connections among them. And even though there are some other matters such as uh, natural disasters and uh, uh, problems such as, of course, uh, AIDS at that time, but today it's also our, uh, our COVID, our COVID problem, et cetera, they were recognized there. I want to, to put a, a, a special focus on the first part of this. Uh, of course, we have a big we have big problems in, in all in all the Americas today. I mean, Latin America is by far, by far, the, the region in which we have of more most organized crime in the world. And if you look at the figures of the UN, the UN figures in the in the first ten countries with more crime in the in the world, we have nine Latin American and Caribbean countries. So this is certainly, from my point of view, the main thread. I agree that we have several other matters to deal with, but the issues of, uh, of, 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 of uh, transnational and, uh, and international crime, the issues of drug traffic, the issue of corruption, money laundering, and of course, uh, 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 people tra uh, human traffic also is very strong today. And we haven't been able to deal, to deal, to, to, to deal enough with them. I, I think that we need much more, much more, more coordination and if I were to review, I don't think that you need to, I don't think we need, we need, we need to review the, the, the declaration, but if some part would, would be needed to review, it would be cooperation in these matters of international crime, drug traffic, armed traffic, human traffic, et cetera, that, that are really drowning us. Let me tell you, well, probably I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm thinking from the country that according to the UN figures has the lowest figure in crime. That's true. But then it, crime has risen, has doubled, in the, in, in, in murders have doubled in my country in the past year. And the rise, the, the, the rise of, of, of uh, organized crime was something that was talked about. And sometimes, but today is the main problem in Chile. If you talk to people in the streets of Santiago, Chile, they will tell you that crime and organized crime are the first, the, the, the largest problem in the, in the hemisphere. So if we're going to deal with the matters that have to do with all the continent, we have certainly to to agree that this issue is probably outstanding in the summit uh, for the summit of the Americas, and it should be outstanding when we analyze our our very good uh, our very good uh, uh, declaration on security in the on multilateral, multilateral security in the Americas, which is, from my point of view, very valid, still very valid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Senator Ansulsa, uh, for your opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Farfan Mendez. Cecilia, it's great to see you. Over to you for your opening remarks. Um, hello, Ryan. It's great to see you too. And uh, good morning to my fellow panelists. It's a pleasure to join you this morning for this um, conversation. So let me begin my, uh, my remarks by saying that 2003 was a very different time for Mexico, even though we hosted uh, that meeting, we were definitely not discussing violence and security in the way that we do today. So basically, almost 20 years later after that declaration, I can also say that the context of which, uh, how we discuss Mexico in the context of this declaration has changed um, considerably. Um, I agree with Senator Insulza in terms of how he's uh, mentioning how how these threats have, have evolved. And I agree with the point of organized crime and the impact that it has had in the region. But I would also like to highlight um, that we're also at a point where the human costs of misguided uh, approaches to some of these threats have really, um, uh, the numbers that we're seeing are staggering. So just recently, the number of overdose deaths that was announced in the US is over 100,000. This week, Mexico also passed that threshold of over 1,000 people who are, uh, are missing and are disappeared. Uh, and not to mention, of course, the high homicide rates that we see in the region. So I would just like to highlight again that those human costs that we're seeing in terms of security compared to what was 2003 are staggering. I am also very concerned, and you know, you mentioned in your um, in the in your intro remarks as well how some of the threats 
uh, from 2003 are not mentioned, right? Like cybersecurity. But I would also point out of how some of these violences that we see in the region have shifted and even spill over to other areas. And so I'm very concerned, for example, about uh, the violences that women experience in the region and that we continue to see. Of course, uh, some of the numbers and the statistics that we observe have to do with having better ways to measure that violence. So I understand there's um, uh, there's that element to that, but certainly the, the violences that women face every day in the region have also shifted. And that's something that's not to be um, disregarded. And similar to journalists, especially those who focus on investigative journalism and who uh, uncover the links of corrupt dealings between, of course, government officials um, in different levels of government, as well as um, violence that's happening in, in Mexico. Um, I'm going to be very brief with these open remarks because I really want us to have this conversation. And I, I'm just going to close this first round by saying that I know as academics, we are uh, very good at sometimes at saying what doesn't work and we're not as good at saying what works, right? And what has been um, effective. And so I would like to say that on the positive note and what I see uh, as, as a space of opportunities that I still believe that these international instruments are uh, provide a space of opportunity. And if anything, if we have seen some movement uh, in terms of where the region is going, how security has, uh, has been managed, I would say that it has really to do with what has happened at the international level. And so the hope is that those discussions that take place at the UN and, so, and that I understand, for example, um, you know, and other, of course, uh, international venues. So we'll see as feel good exercises and just diplomats patting each other on the back, really have an opportunity to be implemented in the domestic side. And I'm thinking specifically, for example, uh, of uh, UNGAS 2016, where there was a very strong push to think about um, drugs and in the region, not from a security perspective alone, but really think thinking about them from a public health perspective. And so that really is a, a shift in tone that I think you know, the region is slowly moving there. There has been, of course, some backsliding uh, in some countries, but I think that is an important international instrument. And you know, just recently, I think also what has been achieved on the Commission on Narcotics at the United Nations and thinking about the links between drug trafficking and firearms trafficking, which may seem obvious to us, but at the same time, having it uh, reflected on an international instrument again, uh, I think it's it's important. So I, I have reasons to be concerned, as I mentioned, you know, these shifting violences and how they have um, alter the lives of, of women and journalists and activists uh, in the region. But I, I also think there's some uh, room for optimism with these international instruments. And I, I really hope we can get into a conversation about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Farfan Mendez, uh, for your opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Chavez, for your opening remarks. Good morning. It's so it's really great. It's really great to be here. I, I want to thank Florida International University. Um, this conference is something I always look forward to. And um, Ryan, it's it's really great to see you. Um, so I thought. First of all, I think this is a great opportunity to reflect on multidimensional security on the eve of the, the Declaration's 20th anniversary. And I actually kind of like spending time reading through the document served as a great reminder that a lot has changed. And as Ryan said at the get go, it doesn't fully reflect today's security picture. So I thought I would do is very briefly touch on five areas that I think we as a hem hemisphere should prioritize that either get no or very little attention in the 2003 document. The first one is climate change. Um, it only com comes up once in the entire document and it's on the pen penultimate page and it's two sentences beginning with climate change could <laughs> constitute a threat or concern. And I think we all are, we've moved beyond that. Um, so I think that climate change and its impact on security should be at the front and center of all discussions about hemispheric security cooperation. And just as it's important too to keep in mind that climate change is representative of today's threats that transcend borders and that require cooperation and coordination among countries. The second um, is related to climate change and that is humanitarian assistance disaster response which should also re receive greater attention given the increase in extreme weather events, especially its impact on the countries of the Caribbean and Central America. And this I just wanted to highlight also because 
typically this is a role where security forces or the military um, can step in. And of course, always in support of civilian authorities. And um, the Inter-American System, um, the Conference of Defense Ministers of the Americas, which is actually mentioned in the 2003 resolution, has been working very hard um, on developing a hemisphere-wide disaster relief mechanism. And I have to say here to my dear friend, Anthony Philip Spencer, um, who has been really, was a real force for good on this, on this initiative in the Inter-American Defense System and who I very much um, worked very closely with in the lead up to the um, CDMA in, in Trinidad and Tobago on this very um, issue. The third has already been touched on and it's internal security, um, crime and violence. Um, Senator Insulza talked about this, so did Cecilia. Um, I think any future document should highlight that this is one of the principal challenges. And also in its discussions of solutions, I think it's important to be clear that militarization is not the answer. And we've learned this the hard way. Hard way. So I think there should be wording that highlights <coughs> the needs for stronger justice systems to deal with the impunity issue, but also police reform, strengthening the police. Um, and of course, this is closely tied to issues of democracy and human rights. Um, the, the, I know I'm going quickly, I wanna go through this um, so we can get to conversation, but the declaration was written in the wake of United, the United, UN Security Council resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. And as such, I'm grateful to see that this document or to be reminded that this document actually includes a short paragraph on enhancing the participation of women in efforts to promote peace and security. We've made a lot of progress since 2003 um, through national action plans. And we see women playing a much greater role in decision-making when it comes to conf conflict prevention, conflict management, and conflict resolution, but we still have a long way to go. Um, and finally, um, I think that the declaration does mention the importance of protection and assistance to refugees and asylum system, um, system seekers. Um, so I think this should play a much bigger role in future conversations, um, especially in today's context. I know we're all familiar with what's going on. It's a region-wide crisis, the 6.1 and counting Venezuelan refugees, you know, the issue of Nicaraguans um, leaving, um, fleeing the political oppression and the economic crisis um, in Nicaragua. And of course, um, Haitians that are, are fleeing, you know, a very fragile state. So I think um, going forward, we need to know, we need to, to really work on this. And also as we're thinking about ways to deal with this as a hemisphere, recognizing that um, militarizing migration um, policy is in pure enforcement is, is, not, is not the answer. So um, I'll stop there and thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Chavez, for your opening remarks and for those five uh, priority areas that you've highlighted. I think we'll come back to quite a few of those in our, in our moderated portion of the discussion. Uh, last but not least, I want to go over to Ambassador Philip Spencer for, for his opening remarks. Um, Ambassador Philip Spencer, it's, it's a shame we can't do this in person. We're neighbors. Uh, I'm, I'm right across the street from, from your embassy. Uh, but, but nevertheless, good morning to you, Ambassador, and over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Dr. Berg. I hope you hear me clearly. Let me begin, like others, by congratulating the Jack Gordon Institute at FIU for hosting this seventh annual Hemispheric Security Conference. It's an important annual forum for reflecting on both the observations from the past and opportunities in the future for hemispheric security. I must also acknowledge the other distinguished panelists who have spoken before me. Um, I recognize in particular now Senator um, Jose Miguel in Sousa, whose leadership, in fact, as the OAS Secretary General during the first decade of the DSA, and when I say DSA, I'm referring to the Declaration on Security in the Americas, I was privileged to observe firsthand. And of course, I must also acknowledge um, Dr. Rebecca Chavez, Abel Chavez, the current and barrier breaking, as I refer to our first female president of the Inter-American Dialogue. I've always regarded her as a mentor and friend. Good to be here. I am now meeting Dr. Farfan, so a pleasure to meet you. 
But in my observations on Outlook from re-examining the DSA, I've noted that from exactly one year after its adoption until today, I have been personally and intimately engaged in pursuing its aspirations and promoting its achievements. So essentially, I've always been a DSA champion. And without being repetitive of my distinguished fellow panelists, the DSA expressed at the time the imperatives for all countries and citizens in the Americas. You know, the need to update our concept of security in a global security environment that we know was reshaped by two major events, a major geopolitical shift, uh, where we assume there would be a, a unipolar world after 1990, and of course the, the tragic events of the attacks, terrorist attacks on September 11. In summary, the DSA represented the culmination of the 12-year process that Senator Insulza referred to, which began in Chile in 1991, and principally informed our outlook for what we thought would be a unipolar global geo. Uh, global geopolitics, geoeconomics, and geostrategy, and of course, um, global institutional governance. What's interesting is that in this hemisphere, during that 12-year period, what I refer to as hemispheric and regional summit diplomacy tried, so that we had a wave of assumed and asserted shared geopolitical identity, ideology, and interest. And this was happening despite the fact that there were warnings from Norman Govan Cooper and Heine and several others that, and I just quote here a little bit from Heine, um, developments over the past decade, and he was looking back in 2009, the developments over the past decade have significantly ordered, altered the political, ideological, and institutional landscape of Latin America. It also inspired, um, I think as others have commented, um, lots of institutionalization of summits, so we have the summits of the Americas, you had Mercosur and regional organizations. So you had Mercosur and CETA in 91, the ACS in 94. And of course, we had some um, important instruments in the hemisphere, SIFTA and CICTE in 97 and 2002, respectively. So together with the declaration of Bridgetown, where we adopted the, the, the multidimensional approach to security in the Americas, what we had was a, ne a necessity for simultaneously, you know, in a kind of Rosano type um, perspective on the complexity of the day, we had to embrace the continuity, what we need to continue doing, or what was changing in the global environment. And so that's where the DSA, as I understood it, came from. You know, Ivlaw Griffith, um, I think it was in 97, he tried to suggest that sovereignty was under siege, at least in the Caribbean. But of course, uh, we had to continue that, um, state sovereignty and state security um, um, dimension of, of, of our hemispheric security outlook. And at the core, you know, that really reflected the promotion and protection of power and interest. And coming from a small country in the hemisphere, um, you know, um, power was not or is not um, really what characterizes our security reality. And our interests are generally meant to be very carefully negotiated in the space. So member states themselves declared, however, that security is strengthened when we deepen its human dimension. And if you want the specifics, that's in fact in subparagraph 4E in the declaration itself. So my outlook as I conclude is this, beginning with the realities, the current realities of migration, it is this human dimension of hemispheric security which is characterized by the imperatives of transnationality, multidimensionality, sustainability, diversity, inclusion, equity, or justice, and resilience, that I think must now be the future focus of the DSA. The DSA has already embraced fully transnationality and multidimensionality. We heard Senator Insulza describe that. Um, it hinted at the prioritization of sustainability, and thank you, Dr. Chavez, for uh, pointing out that climate change was mentioned in that one point. So, you know, there's a hint at the importance of sustainability, and it mentioned social inclusion and social justice only in passing. So, in conclusion, it would now appear necessary for the DSA as we go forward to be updated to reflect more integrated, inclusive, and innovative focus on at least four 
cross cutting and complex priorities. I don't have five, I only have four. And these priorities on which I'll comment further during our interactive dialogue are resilience, inclusion, sustainability, and equity. So if so in the future, I'm going to focus a lot of my comments on those. And specifically, we need to we need to give greater consideration now on promoting what I describe as equitable security and sustainable security. Yes, we must continue to focus on the multidimensionality and transnationality and all that, but there is an issue of equity, social justice, social inclusion. Yes, several of those people who are people who feel as though their rights are not secure. We now have to lift our gaze and focus on those. And I think only then we'll really enhance what I would describe as a coherent collective and concerted pursuit of improved security in the Americas. Um, you know, equity and sustainability, in my view, are absolutely necessary for justice and peace in the Americas. Thank you again for allowing me to contribute to this dialogue, and I look forward to the discussion that will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador Philip Spencer, for your opening remarks. Thank you to all of our panelists for those enlightening and illuminating opening remarks. Um, I want to remind folks who are tuning in that uh, there is a Q&A box down at the bottom. As folks say things that generate questions for you, please start populating the Q&A box in our, in our Zoom chat. Um, also, I uh, just want to remind folks that if you are listening uh, in English, you'd like to listen in Spanish or Portuguese, we have simultaneous interpretation. Hoy tenemos interpretación simultánea durante el evento para nuestra audiencia hispanohablante. Hay un icono del globo que encontrará en su pantalla y que dice interpretation. Elija español. Agora para nuestra audiencia uh, que, que fala portugués, si você quiser ouvir o programa em português, clique no icono no globo na tela que diz interpretation y escolha portugués. Um, let's jump into the moderated portion of the, the discussion as folks are hopefully asking questions to, to populate the chat box for our Q&A. Um, and I wanna talk about the, the Summit of the Americas. It's, it's right around the corner. Um, we're getting slow trickles of information about, um, about a potential agenda uh, for, for the hemisphere um, and, and for the Summit of the Americas. But uh, we don't have that much information. And so insofar as we can glean, I think it's, it's clear that security um, isn't going to be one of, the, one of the focal points. And so I want to ask each one of our panelists, um, you know, should security absolutely be one of the focal points at the Summit of the Americas? And, and if, it is, if it should be a focal point at the Summit of the Americas, you know, give me an, an issue or two uh, that would be uh, on the agenda, in, in your opinion, given the, the limited nature of, of these meetings, the fact that you can't have too many agenda points uh, and so forth. I'll go through and start with Senator Insulsa and go forward in the same order that, that I started. But just some quick responses on, should security be um, one of the main focal points at the Summit of the Americas this year? And if so, you know, give me, give me your, your top one or two uh, focal points within that, that agenda point. And Senator, you're, you're muted. Okay. No, I fully agree that, uh, that security should be an issue. I mean, I think that uh, the, the main topics today between Latin America and the, and, and the, and, and, and South and the, the US basically have to do with, with matters of security in several senses and several directions. Cybersecurity, of course, is also one of them, I should, I should say. Drug, I mean, the, 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 the traffic of arms, most of, most of the arms that are used in Latin, in Latin America by gangs in Latin America come from the US. Uh, it, it, immigration has become also, whether we, whether we like it or not, I don't think immigration is just a matter of, uh, it's a matter of security. It has several other dimensions, but certainly the issue of uh, gang, uh, gang uh, I mean, tra transnational violence and, uh, uh, Human traffic and others should be there. I think this is one of the matters that we have to deal with. I mean, if you talk about relations between hemispheric relations, you usually choose crime, immigration. Of course, trade is not an issue today. I mean, I don't think that I don't think that is going to move too much in any direction in this in this uh, 
in, in this in this decade. So I believe that security would be a much better, much more relevant issue for the for the summit than any other one that's been, been dealt with. And probably will will be a matter of more unity between the in, in the region because you know there's a lot of discrepancies about the topics and if it should, if it should be held or not. Everybody will join a summit that had to do with the security matters. One thing I would, well, just a, a small point I would like to make is when I'm saying that security should be, be the main issue, I don't think that we could, we, we, we should rewrite the declaration on security. I agree that we should deal with, uh, with the matters what Cecilia spoke about. We dealt with those, those in the sixth summit in, in Cartagena, the drug, the drug matter and the, uh, more attention to, 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 to health treatments than to, than to other matters. I, I agree with the, the, that that uh, cyber security was not there. Maybe we would, would add them in a, in a, in a joint in, a, in a, an annex declaration. But unfortunately, I have to say this: the 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 the, the, the atmosphere is not to, not good to op, to reopen our main document. We should never we should never try to reopen the charter of the OAS. We should not try to reopen the the, the charter the the, the the democratic charter. We should not reopen the the, the security declaration because we don't know how, if they're going to close in a better way than, the, than, than we have them now. So that, that would be a, just a, a formal opinion. And, and, uh, but I, I agree that security would be an excellent issue to join the countries of the Americas in, the, in, a, good, in a very meaningful summit, summit. And now what matters? Drugs, arms, human traffic, for me would be the three, more, the, the three main matters there. Great, thank you very much, Senator and Sosa. Dr. Farfan Mendez, uh, should security be a, a major focal point at the Summit of the Americas? If so, what are your, your top agenda points within that portfolio? So not that I'm biased, of course, as someone who studies security, but I absolutely <laughs> believe it should be part of the conversation. I do think, however, of course, that maybe uh, conditions for having maybe robust conversations are not there, but let's assume there were. Um, I, I think that, you know, having said that, of course, it should be an important matter. I do think that if countries are going to show up and use the same approaches that we have already used and that we know don't work really well, then, then it would be fruitless. What I would push for uh, in the agenda, if I had, you know, if I could write this letter to Santa Claus, if you will, and I could, you know, introduce some uh, agenda items, I would definitely, um, push for these public health perspectives to some of these questions, uh, firearms, uh, drugs. I think there's been, as I said in my intro remarks, uh, some progress made there, but I think there is uh, much more space to have those conversations about how do we incorporate that public health perspective into these discussions. The other element that I would um, bring to the table is to really pay attention to the subnational level. Uh, we know uh, there's very robust evidence that some interventions at the subnational level, at the local level, can really help uh, solve some of these big security questions that sometimes uh, seem intractable. And so I do think there's a lot of space for using evidence-based uh, interventions at that subnational level. And I don't think countries have really paid attention to that a lot, because I think at times there seems to be a tension between what happens at the federal level or, you know, just at the central level compared to what's happening at the regional level, but just to give a very specific example of what I'm talking about. We know, for example, that naloxone, these um, drug uh, overdose reversal uh, medication saves a lot of lives. And when it is used in some parts of the United States where it is allowed in other parts, unfortunately, there's very strict regulations uh, for that. We know uh, when you have those harm reduction approaches, you can save lives. And therefore, you know, again, these human costs uh, of misguided policies are, are reduced. Uh, right now at the US-Mexico border, we're seeing also an increase uh, of overdose deaths um, on the Mexican side, not only by Mexican users, but also US users who are traveling to Mexico. Right now, naloxone is not available. Um, on the Mexican side, it is moved to Mexico via, uh, let's call it informal trade from the US to Mexico. And we know, for example, that something that um, simple that is also not expensive could save a lot of lives. And yet we're not looking at that uh, subnational space because that conversation is still very much stuck uh, at the federal level. And so if I, if I had my way, if I could introduce some agenda items, again, I would look at this public health perspective and I would also pay attention a lot to that uh, subnational level. 
Thank you, Dr. Farfan Mendez. Dr. Bill Chavez, uh, I like this formulation of a letter to Santa Claus. So if security is on your agenda <laughs> for the Summit of the Americas, what's on your letter to Santa Claus? Well, first of all, I just want to wholeheartedly agree with what Cecilia said about, first of all, looking at the subnational level for solutions um, and also the public health approach. Um, I, I think those are both such important points. Um, so my letter to Santa Claus would, would I think, so when we do know that democracy, of course, is gonna be a theme of the summit and the 2003 declaration does, you know, it highlights democracy and human rights. And if you look at the region, one of the, re and, you know, surveys show that there's a declining faith in democracy, that it doesn't deliver. And one of the main reasons there's this declining um, faith in democracy is, is one of the public goods it's not delivering is citizen security. Um, so I think that that um, should be front and center. Um, and I think um, when it comes to citizen security, I would recommend that the nation come together either at the summit, this could be something that also happens in other, other inter-American um, conversations, but you know, what is the best way to address this? Again, looking at the subnational level, like Cecilia said, because this, you know, as I look back, this document was written in 2003. It was 2006 when President Calderon said, okay, so we're gonna have a short-term solution to this problem. It's gonna be short-term, we're gonna call in the military to, to handle this issue. Here we are, 2022, the military has not been the solution. So again, I would, I would, um, I would, my, my, part of my wish would be a, a commitment to really work on, focus more on judicial, the judicial sector and also on the police. Um, another part of security that um, uh, Cecilia, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of yours as I say this, is something else that Cecilia mentioned was um, gender-based violence. Um, I think that this needs to be part of any discussion. And I think this also hits on Anthony Philip Spencer comment about inclusive security. Um, we're seeing a huge rise in gender-based violence and domestic violence due, due to COVID. The femicide rates in some countries in the region are among the highest in the world. Let's talk about that. We need to talk about that. And the final wish list would be, final component of my um, wish list would have to do with um, just the, the issue of protection and assistance to refugees. Um, and again, I think this has to do with um, Ambassador Philip Spencer point about inclusion. Um, I think we really need to come together as a hemisphere given that just the, the magnitude of the refugee crisis in our region um, and just you know irregular migration that is happening really everywhere, <laughs> that we need to come together um, and talk about how, how we're gonna do this, how we're gonna do a better job um, in this area. But thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Bill Chavez. Over to you, Anthony, uh, Ambassador uh, Philip Spencer, for, for your wish list of security is going to be a, a major theme of the summit. Great, thanks very much, Ryan. Um, so I'll make a wish list. I'm not expecting Santa the summit, um, sorry. <laughs> but but I do want to give you a response that might surprise you, given that I'm the current chair of the OES Hemisphere of Committee on Hemispheric Security. I think security is in fact included in what we are addressing at the summit. If you go back to my four priorities of resilience, inclusion, sustainability, and equity, so there is in fact a political commitment that we're negotiating. And by the way, I'm Trinidad Tobago's national coordinator for the summit's process. So that's how come I know. <laughs> um, there's a specific commitment that addresses health and resilience. So I'm particularly attracted, like Dr. Chavez, to the um, suggestion, recommendation from Dr. Farfan that we find a way to properly reflect the public health um, dimension of the security um, reality um, into the, that, that political commitment. Um, I'm also, in fact, I, I want to pick up that citizen security um, comment from Dr. Chavez as something I'll, I'll probably have to go now and see if it's possible to, to build support for it. Uh, uh, perhaps in the commitment on democratic governance, 
we need to have something that speaks more specifically to issues of citizen security, um, the law enforcement and judiciary. So I'll probably, I think from this discussion here, there is opportunity to even further integrate. And I'm, I believe in integrating things. That's the only way you, you come up with coherent responses. And how can we integrate the new perspective of the, uh, the hemisphere's key security priorities, resilience, inclusion, uh, all of the marginalized groups, um, uh, sustainability, which is also addressed in that resolution, uh, in that draft political commitment on our green and sustainable future. Yes. So that's how I think security, uh, without being labeled specifically as security, has place. From this discussion, I see opportunities for us to, to perhaps advance language to even strengthen it. And I fully agree with the comments made by, um, I, I know the Senator more as Secretary General in Sousa, but uh, Senator in Sousa, um, I fully agree with the comments that he made in his lead off comments. Um, so, so yes, um, no wish list for me, um, specific things that I feel we could go and try to have included in the outcomes of the summit. And um, yes, public health, citizen security, a greater focus on migration and refugees and, and, and the other comments that Senator Insulza uh, uh, suggested. I fully agree. Security is there. Thanks, Ambassador Philip Spencer. I, I wanna go right back to you, Ambassador Philip Spencer, because um, I'm, I'm delighted to say that the, the Q&A box is indeed filling up and that's good. That means we're generating discussion. And I did notice that something popped up that was specifically directed at you. Uh, and you mentioned uh, equitable security once again in, in your second response. And, and this question goes directly to that point. So I wanna give you a chance to drill down on this and explain a little bit more. Uh, Camila Braga asks, uh, what is equitable security? What should it entail? Um, please have uh, Ambassador Philip Spencer elaborate. Good, well, thanks very much for, um... I'm not sure the person who posed the question, but what we need to understand is that equity is in fact one of the greatest challenges in our hemisphere. There is a sense in many groups, marginalized groups, um, vulnerable groups, they don't feel that they have a fear um, chance at just living a secure life. Women who are victims of domestic violence, um, all the other forms and expressions of whether it's gender-based violence or violence against, you have violence against children. We need in our hemisphere to address that issue of equity, which is not equality. Equality is another challenge, yes? I'm not talking about equality, just equity. I want justice. So we're hearing a discussion more and more of social justice, racial justice, environmental justice. And so we need to craft, just as there is already established a body of knowledge on sustainable security, which addresses issues of climate change and food security and all those other things, health and so on. We now need, as I keep focusing, our attention is the human dimension of our hemisphere's security that I think we now need to pick up. It's, it's mentioned in the DSA. It's there. It's mentioned there. I think what we need to do now is recognizing the challenges that have arisen. We now need to find a way. So equitable security, if I could just end with, uh, with a fairly clear expression of the concept, is ensuring that our approach to security prioritizes the promotion and protection of all forms of justice for our citizens. We put in people at the center of our approach to security. That's what it's about. And I look forward to chatting after. Um, you know, I'm a believer that we have to design the concepts that suit our reality. We need a focus on equitable security here in the Americas. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Ambassador Philip Spencer and, and Camila. I, I hope that answered your question as a, as a sort of direct treatment of the, the issue of equity. I've noticed Dr. Bill Chavez has raised her hand using the Zoom function, so I want to go over to you. I think you have an intervention to make. No, I just, I just wanted to give an example of what Ambassador Phillips um, Spencer is, is talking about, and it's in the context of climate change. And when we come up, when we're thinking about solutions and, and climate change adaptation, um, I think this is an example where inclusion um, and equity are incredibly important. So I'm thinking about when who bears the brunt of, of climate change. And I'm thinking that, you know, and if we see this in Central America and the um, Caribbean, that the most vulnerable groups are the poor, women, youth. Um, so it's the subsistence farmers. It is the those who are living in um, urban communities where, you know, low lying parts of, of cities with flimsy buildings and, um, you know, very um, flood prone areas, or we all know um, about the communities that are built in on hillsides, um, hillsides and, you know, with the in, ex, increase in extreme weather events, these are the communities that are getting, are getting hit the hardest. So as we, as we think about climate change, for example, as a national um, or as uh, international security or hemispheric security um, challenge. I think this is one area where I just, I think it highlights exactly what Ambassador Philip Spencer is talking about. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Bill Chavez. Super good example of, of some of the um, terms that, that, that we're using um, uh, to, to describe uh, different approaches to security. Um, when I went through the document again, it sounds like we all went back and, and read as preparation for this event, some of us multiple times, the 2003 uh, declaration. And the thing that I was struck with most was actually the, the number of times it, rec it recognized democracy as the region's real strength and real asset. And Dr. Bill Chavez mentioned uh, in one of her interventions specifically that one of the reasons we've seen such an eroding trust uh, in democracy as capable of delivering is because of the region's failures um, uh, on security. Another thing that I want to, to, to bring into this is the emergence um, since the, the 2003 declaration of what I would call uh, uh, criminal states, states that are very much involved in the transnational organized crime activity of the hemisphere as a matter of state policy, using institutions of the state, for example, to further uh, transnational criminal interests. Of course, I'm thinking about Venezuela, I'm thinking about Nicaragua, to a lesser extent, Cuba. Um, and, and I want uh, our panelists to, to, to sort of reflect, if they would, very briefly on um, how the declaration perhaps understated uh, the some of the capacities of, of authoritarian leaders um, it, that's, who, who rose in the hemisphere uh, to generate insecurity, to, to be sources of, of insecurity uh, for the region. Um, this new approach that we have of fragile states um, and also criminal states um, and how we should be thinking about, about this because to me, that's a major piece of the declaration that, that's missing despite the fact that the declaration makes a very clear connection to democracy as a, as a major source of security for the region. So I wanna start with, with Senator Nsulsa and go through again uh, in, in the order of, of opening remarks. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, of sirens going around my house at this moment. <laughs> thank you very much. But, but I do think that the whole of the declaration of 2003 was to have a parallel declaration to this, to the to the Inter-American Democratic Charter dealing with matters of security. So actually, uh, the democracy was an assumption of the declaration on, 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 public, on public security. And that has not been exactly the case. I think that, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have the, two, the two, 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 two different cases, as you say. One is uh, that we have some states that have not dealt with the matters of security on the, on the country. Some of them are even exporting them. Venezuela is exporting people at full quantities. I mean, the, the, the number of, of Venezuelan exiles is today as large as the ones occurring in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the wars of the Arab world. By the way, this is an important thing. I mean, this is an interesting thing. If you look at the numbers of, 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 of the UN numbers of, on crime and, and, 
Asia and all that. The, the Latin America has the, the strange situation that we haven't had wars for about 40 years. I, mean, I think that the last attempt at the war was a small war between Peru and, and Ecuador in 1994. And on the, at the same time, we have the, the largest number of uh, largest numbers of uh, of death of violent deaths in the world, together with the Arab countries, in which we have had Iraq and we've had uh, Syria. And uh, I think that uh, the, the, the the failure in Latin America has a lot to do with the lack of democracy. Actually, it has does have to do with the, the shortcomings of democracy in the past years. I mean, of course, uh, then we have. I mean, the, the situations are different. I think that Venezuela is a different situation from Nicaragua. Nicaragua, we have a we have a full full a full a, a dictator as we haven't seen me too many times in the in the past uh, the past century. I mean, one that does whatever he wants. Somebody that tries to to discuss with him and puts him in jail. You form a form an organization and it's the soul that everybody goes to jail. I mean, the, 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 there's no no way of discussing anything in Nicaragua. Daniel Ortega and his wife are in full command of the command of the country. That's one way. Of course, Venezuela is a little bit different. Venezuela is a little bit different, but not that different. I mean, the amount the amount of violence being exported from Venezuela is also is as, as big as the one that still remains in Venezuela. I, I agree that Cuba is to this is to a lesser to a lesser situation. Cuba has a state. It deals with matters of crime and uh, drugs and all that. But it, it still, I mean, most of the dealing of that is only through violence. I mean, there are no, no real, there are no really social social actors in the, in the in the situation. So I do think that democracy is connected. But I also think, let me say this because uh, this is, has been a big a big problem of the of the region that we shouldn't uh, work. I mean, that we, we shouldn't. Uh, uh, I, I don't believe exclusion is a good way with dealing with this matter. I think we have to keep, try to keep as long as we can the dialogue among all the countries of the Americas. We, we should, I mean, the, 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 the good thing about the inter-American system, about the organization of American states is that everybody is a member. The moment in which we start uh, letting members, I mean, doing, doing things that will make members go out, we will have the same problem that we've had in several Latin American countries, the government changes and the, and the international system falls. In Latin America, we had all kinds, we've had about a hundred organizations in the past, uh, in the past a um, uh, hundred years, and they have all been uh, with the soul because the, the government that created, the governments that created are not there anymore. The big thing about the Latin the Inter American system is that it's still an institution that includes everybody, and try, or at least tries to include everybody. So I don't think that, uh, Democracy, I mean, full full democracy should be a condition for participation. This, of course, has to do with the summit. I mean, this is a, I mean, we moved from a summit in which one country was excluded into a summit in which no one was excluded. Now we are moving into a summit in which three countries are not going to be there because they are not going to be invited. And probably others would follow that. I don't think that's a good recipe. I think that we should make an, always make an effort as full as we can to have everybody on board. I hate the Ortega regime. I don't like the Ortega regime. I hope that the Ortega, that the, that the Nicaraguan people do do away with the, the Ortega regime. But by closing just the doors and say we're not going to talk to talk to those people, that I think that we are not making a very, a very big progress in this matter. Excuse me. This has less to do with security, but I wanted to say something about the summit also myself. Thank you. Very timely set of remarks. Thank you, Senator and so, uh, uh, Over to you, Dr. Farfan Mendez. Um. Thank you. Uh, I think on this question about uh, security and democracy, I think a lot of times in the region, it feels like we've been building the fire truck on the way to the fire. And I think that's you know quite challenging, especially as Rebecca was mentioning uh, the question of militarization. And so I would like to highlight, of course, the Mexican case, because one of the things that concerns me is that there seems to be less um, interest and consensus in the need of having civilian institutions as they also relate to public safety questions. And so what we're seeing also is, um, again, in the Mexican case, which I'm very familiar with, not only that the military and the armed forces are carrying out public safety 
um, task, which for a number of reasons is, is not convenient. One of them being the high levels of lethality that they produce um, in confrontations you know, related again to, to the provision of, of public safety, uh, but also that we're seeing that they are increasingly involved in many other duties that don't even have to do with public safety. And so in the Mexican case, we see them building airports, we see them, they're involved uh, in the vaccination strategy from the government. And as a colleague of mine has pointed out, also increasingly in revenue generating um, positions, which again is very concerning from the point of view uh, of democracy. So one of the areas that concerns me is not only these states that you were pointing out, but even states where allegedly we should have these democratic controls that we see the armed forces increasingly acquiring more roles that are hard to see how they're going to uh, to let go of them, not only because they include more responsibility, but of course, because they have come with a significant increase uh, in their budgets as well. And so it's not only that they're receiving more funds, but they're also, again, being put in these situations where they can generate their own revenue. So this lack of commitment to, to creating these civilian institutions that have to do with security and preserving, of course, others that have to do with the checks and balances that we expect to see in a democracy uh, is a trend that, that really concerns me. Thanks so much, Dr. Farfan Mendez. Dr. Bill Chavez, democracy and uh, the role or connection to, uh, to security, as well as some of the backsliding we've seen in, in the region and state fragility and its connection to insecurity. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the question, and and like Cecilia, I think what I would really use, what I would really um, highlight here is is just the um, the the growing um, role of militaries in kind of non um, issues that aren't about defense, uh, are not about um, national defense, and um, you know, and and her point about civilian agencies that also can check the executive more broadly. You know, we see this with the, the failure to, when it comes to the judicial, judici the, the courts, we see many in across the region courts that are, are not independent, that lack any autonomy from the executive. Um, and also, you know, when it comes to attorney generals, um, um, the lack of independence of eternal attorney generals. Um, you know, and I think that this, this the degradation of democracy, um, as Senator Insulza points out, um, just like with the summit, the 2003, the, the 1994 summit happened at a time when there was this assumption that democracy was kind of in this, um, this, this rot was on, democracy was on a rise. There wasn't a threat necessarily of any sort of reverse wave um, that we're seeing now. Um, but one thing as a community of nations that the hemispheres can, community of nations, I think we have to acknowledge that we have failed um, to address effectively the destruction. I mean, the, the deliberate destruction of democratic institutions. And so, you know, we have the very ambitious goals of the 2001 Inter, Inter-American Charter, um, which, you know, calls for, you know, countries to speak out multilaterally in a unanimous voice um, to take a regional stance um, on this matter, and and we see we've seen that you know that hasn't happened. Um, so I would I think that this is a challenge that we as a hemisphere have to have to um, come together to address because we we need to address this as a region as a hemisphere. Thank you so much, Dr. Bill Chavez. I want to I want to stick with you for one second before I go to Ambassador uh, Philip Spencer because we've gotten a question in the in the chat box about. Uh, police and police capacity, and it's a good question. Um, you mentioned it, and both uh, both you and uh, Dr. Farfan Mendez mentioned it. But I want to have you answer this question because you were DASD at the Pentagon. This is right in your wheelhouse. It's stuff that you were working on when you were working in government. Um, and the question is basically, uh, okay, if we want to reform police, uh, that that's great. But some, and that's the right thing to do. But it, in in many ways, uh, the the magnitude of the challenge we face is, is a question of capacity for the police, or in this case, incapacity. And so that then generally tends to transform these questions into uh, questions of the armed forces, or it tends to lead leaders to look to the armed forces for solutions. And in that case, it, it moves from being a security issue to a defense issue. So the question is really, you know, what to do? We can talk about capacity building, we can talk about police reform, 
But if the magnitude of, of, the, of the security problem is such that you have to rely on, on the armed forces, um, what, what to do a, a, about that? And that's an excellent question. And this is something that I really, I mean, as, as you know, Ryan, this is something I focused a, a lot on as DASD. Um, and because it is, I think this is a trend that is, that the reliance on the military is a trend that we're seeing through, we've, and we've seen it, this isn't new. We've seen it happening throughout the region. I think a problem is, is that when you rely on the, you know, you, you hear a lot of countries, and I, I'm gonna use the Mexico example here uh, because I'm, I know Cecilia probably has something to add. Um, but you know, the intention in 2006 was that this would be a short-term fix. But starting to rely on the military so heavily kind of created, there were no longer any incentives to, to strengthen the police. So you had the discussion of the gendarmerie. You know, with AMLO, we have this discussion, you know, this idea that, no, we're gonna create a National Guard, but we all know that the National Guard is a, is a militarized, organ, a militarized um, institution. Um, so, the reliance on the military, unfortunately, takes away unless you have a clear path, like you have to have an off ramp for the military, which is going to be involved with gradual strengthening of the police. I think from a US perspective, when it comes to where we're prioritizing our funding, we should be actually, and I we saw this with under Obama with the Central America strategy. I was really pleased to see that DOD did not have a huge role. Instead of you, you know, using the money that we had at the time as a UN, USG, as the entire US government, the money instead went to strengthening the police. I think on the DOD side, what money we did receive was, was spent on defense, went to defense institution building, which is really meant to increase the transparency and the accountability of the armed forces. So, um, you know, I think this is, is it's going to, it's not going to be in this, the question is absolutely right on, right? This is not going to happen overnight due to the magnitude of the, of the security challenges in the region. But we have to develop off ramps, like a plan. There's, there, we don't have plans. We just, there's no, you know, how kind of the, with, with the steps and with metrics to measure how, how we're progressing on this matter so that there is an off ramp for the military. And the off ramp might be a little bit longer than we'd like it to be. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, but we need to develop, start developing um, an off-ramp. Thank you, Dr. Bill Chavez. I noticed that uh, Dr. Farfan Mendez raised her hand. Real quick intervention from you, and then I want to go back, as I promised, to, to Ambassador Philip Spencer for his remarks on democracy and its link to, to security. Sure. Uh, just very quickly to complement what Rebecca was saying, I think it's not only the off-ramp, but also the commitment from incoming governments to not try to reinvent the wheel every time we have a new administration. And I think that has also been problematic in the region that with security matters, every administration wants to do its own thing rather than, you know, understanding there may be already an institutional uh, framework to work with. And so this destruction of institutions uh, that constantly happens within the security framework, I think, has also been quite problematic. I mean, for Mexico, for sure, but I'm uh, other countries in the region as well. Thank you, Dr. Farfan Mendez. Switching gears back to um, back to the link between the nexus between democracy and security and fragility or authoritarian nature of states and insecurity. Your comments on on that, Ambassador Philip Spencer. Thanks very much, and I'm happy that I was able to wait because some of the things that that, that I may have wanted to see have already been highlighted. I go back to my um, comment in my opening remarks. We're we have held on to this use of state sovereignty and state security. And that state security is essentially about power and interest. So where we have had instances where power and the national interests have been in the hands of, of, of state leaders, um, where transparency, accountability, and all those things that we need for democracy are, are uncertain. Um, that's, that's how you see the undermining and the erosion of um, democracy. Um, I also want to remind, and in fact, in my notes, supplemental notes, it struck me 
that the DSA is a declaration. It's not a charter, it's a declaration. So <laughs> it's not a resolution, it's, it's a declaration. It's an expression at the time based on, there was a sense of euphoria, you know, you know we were all together, you know. Um, some people were beginning to signal warnings like uh, Norman Govan, Dr. Norman, uh, Professor Norman Govan, uh, and, and others, Haini and others, but that didn't matter so much. But let me now um, deal with the, the military, militarization, armed forces, even law enforcement um, influence on the promotion, strengthening of democracy. Um, and this is where I want to highlight a specific success of the DSA. The DSA specifically called for clarifying the relationship between the OAS and the Inter-American Defense Board. And I will assert that in our hemisphere, the Inter-American Defense Board, and particularly after its new statutes in 2006, and in fact, they, uh, we just celebrated the 80th anniversary with a resolution at the Permanent Council 1193. Um, with, I believe that what was done as a result of the DSA in clarifying um, the relationship between the OAS and the IADB in 2006 has helped our hemisphere um, not have the, the, the continuation or advance of that type of um, milit over militarization. Um, um, the professionalization has increased. The Inter-American Defense College has played a major role. And generally, so even through programs like the Defense Institution uh, Reform Initiative, which, which, which um, Dr. Chavez spoke about while she was DASD, the um, Western Hemisphere, those have been some of the major things that have helped quietly push back on any risk of military and law enforcement institutions and establishments further or seeking to undermine democracy. There are other areas, and I agree, um, we need to work at subnational level, we need to work at multiple levels on this, but I thought I shouldn't allow to go unnoticed one clear success of the DSA, which is that it called for, I think it's in paragraph 48 or 49, um, called for the clarifying of the clarification of the relationship that was done in 2006, three years after the um, DSA um, was adopted. And I believe that in our hemisphere, we are more peaceful because we were able to succeed at doing that. And again, I refer to the leadership of Senator Insusa, then as the, as the Secretary General of the OAS in achieving that success. Um, Thank you, uh, I Ambassador. I support the other comments that have been made generally. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ambassador Philip Spencer. I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. We've got about four or five minutes remaining here before I hand it back to, to Randy, our, our MC. And, and I wanna give you each a chance to make very, very brief uh, closing remarks uh, be before we hand back the, the panel to, to Randy. Uh, there were a ton of questions in the chat box. We didn't get to hardly uh, as many as, as I would have liked, but it's clear that we've, we've touched a nerve here with a discussion on the reexamination of the 2003 declaration. And I'll note, there are some things that we that we would have uh, proffered, profited from discussing, which we didn't even bring up. There was no mention of, of COVID-19 uh, and how it, how it might change the security landscape moving forward. And as mentioned, there was a certain geopolitical environment in 2003, which is certainly not the case anymore. And so the word China and the mention of the rise of China and its implications uh, for hemispheric security were not mentioned at all. Uh, but, but nevertheless, I want to give each one of you a chance to make very, very brief closing remarks, and then we'll hand back the, the, the panel to, to Randy. First to you, Senator Insulsa, 30 to 45 seconds. Thank you very much. I very much, I would, would like to stress my, my agreement with Ambassador Philip Spencer's views on equity and equality also in security. I mean, I think that this has been a problem in all countries. Inequality exists in our slum areas, in our, our poorer, poorer areas, but they're much more threatened than by crime than the middle class and the large upper class. And then the, the, we have the, the crimes that have been committed very strongly during the, during the pandemic. In my country, uh, domestic violence has risen five times, five times as more as it was before the, uh, the, 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 the pandemic. So actually, 
we, I do believe that the democracy, equality, and uh, are very much linked. I mean, it, there is a, there is a, a statistical correlation between crime, between crime, between the, the crime and the inequality and poverty. That's a fact. I mean, we don't like to say this, of course. I'm not saying that poor people tend to to commit more crimes, etc. But there is a certain a certain re relation between the existence of democracy and the existence of more equality with the, with the rise in crime. And that's a fact. I mean, you just have to look at the figures of which are the countries in the world in which more crimes are committed and the countries in the world in which least, least crimes are committed. And there's a clear relation between democratic and more developed countries and, 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 and a better, a better uh, security for the people. Thank you very much, Senator and Sulsa. Over to you, Dr. Farfan Mendez. Quick 30 to 45 second reflection on, on today and closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, I'll bring COVID-19 into the conversation so we can mention it once at least. Um, I do think that the pandemic as a security concern offers an opportunity for governments to rethink precisely security um, and health policies going back to that. So I think there is, there is a space and a window of opportunity for governments and of course other actors to work within that framework if, if they choose to do that. So I think the pandemic opens up that space. Um, and just to finalize, uh, I want to thank again um, for the invitation uh, for having me speak here. And again, thank you to my wonderful uh, colleagues for having this conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Farfan Mendez. Over to you, Dr. Bill Chavez, quick closing remarks. Okay, it's just thank you. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to mention one thing that we didn't talk about that's also in the declaration and that is the role of civil society. So I just wanted to highlight that as um, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but I think when we're talking about security and the issues we're talking about, the importance of civil society as an actor in all of these conversations. Thank you, Dr. Bill Chavez. Last word and quick word over to you, Ambassador Philip Spencer. Thank you very much. And um, civil society in fact speaks to putting um, or deepening the human dimension on security in our hemisphere. And I'll close with this comment I made when I assumed the chairmanship of the CHS this year. Um, just as we've long accepted there could be no development without security, in the face of the current challenges of climate change, food insecurity, cybercrime, irregular migra uh, migration, gender and social inequality, violence against women, gender-based violence, and global pandemics, it's now clear that there can be no sustainable development without equitable and sustainable security. That's when we bring security, not only focus on state security, but on human or citizen security, and we deepen the human dimension where we deliver and people feel confident that the democracy that they're being asked to support is delivering on their most important interest in life to survive and live and thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Philip Spencer. Thank you to all of our panelists for what was a riveting discussion on, on security in the hemisphere. Senator Jose Miguel Insulza, Dr. Cecilia Farfan Mendez, uh, Dr. Bill Chavez, and Ambassador Anthony Philip Spencer. Thank you very much indeed for this conversation. Randy, over to you. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks to all of our panelists, uh, good friends uh, there on the panel. So very uh, substantive discussion and glad that uh, we were able to finish uh, close to time. So appreciate that, Ryan. Uh, 